Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening at Books and Books on this beautiful South Florida evening. I hope everyone's enjoying the free air conditioning we have outside. First and foremost, if I could get you to turn off your cell phone so we don't have any interruptions, that would be wonderful. And also, don't forget to go to our website, booksandbooks.com. You can get apprised of all the events we have there at the at the uh, all of our stores around the uh, city and uh, this store as well. If you don't want to do that, you can give us your email address, and we can send you blasts for everything that goes on here at the store. That is, if you don't mind, 20 or 30 emails every five minutes or so. Also, pick up a copy of our newsletter. We have this on the counter. You can pick up this tonight while you're buying a copy of Secrecy World. Secrecy World offers a disturbing and sobering view of how the world really works and raises critical questions about financial and legal institutions we may once have trusted. Jake Bernstein was a senior reporter on the International Consortium of Investigative Journalist team that broke the Panama Papers story. In 2017, the project won the Pulitzer Prize for explanatory reporting. Bernstein earned his first Pulitzer Prize in 2011 for national reporting for coverage of the financial crisis. He's written for the Washington Post, Blomberg, The Guardian, ProPublica, and Vice, and has appeared on BBC, NBC, CNN, PBS, and NPR. He was the editor of the Texas Observer. Please give him a nice and warm books and books welcome, Mr. Jake Bernstein. It is, it is great to be here. It is great to see so many uh, old friends who I haven't seen in a long time. Uh, thank you so much to Books and Books and to Mitchell Kaplan, the proprietor of this wonderful bookstore. I don't know if you all know, but Mitchell now makes movies in addition to selling books. And his latest is currently in theaters. It's called The Man Who Invented Christmas. My wife and I saw it the other day, and our review is that it is delightful. It's a balm to tortured writers and their family members everywhere. Um, I encourage everyone to see it. So, the secrecy world. What is the secrecy world? It's a phrase that encompasses an entire shadow economy. It includes tax havens like the British Virgin Islands and the Seychelles and Jersey. It's also places that offer secret bank accounts like Switzerland and Singapore, Hong Kong. And also the intermediaries who service this shadow world, world lawyers, accountants, uh, trust companies, uh, incorporators of anonymous shell companies. Now, I wish I had invented this phrase because I love it, but I did not. I came upon it while rummaging through the Panama Papers. There are more than 11, these are the more than 11.5 million documents from the Panamanian law firm Mossack Fonseca. And they were plundered by an anonymous source and given to a German newspaper called Süddeutsche Zeitung, which then shared it with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. I was part of the team that spent a year digging through those documents. And in the documents, I found this amazing glossary of offshore terms. It had been written by a junior employee at uh, Mossack Fonseca. And what made it so fantastic was that a senior lawyer had gone through the document and deleted the places where the original author had been a little too candid, a little too truthful. It was all there plain as day in the miracle of track changes. So for example, there was an entry for aggressive tax avoidance. And the lawyer had removed the phrase uncertain legality from the definition. It was stuff like that. Anyway, toward the end of the document, I came upon this term secrecy world. And the definition read in part, the secrecy world encompasses the unregulated market and all those who create and promote secrecy jurisdictions and what they offer. And indeed, while anonymous shell companies can be completely legal and perhaps a shrewd business strategy, one of their greatest values is that they offer concealment. Now, that could be hiding your activities or assets from the business partners or your wife or in some places kidnappers. It could also be hiding your activities or assets from government tax collectors. Or law, or law enforcement, because you're laundering money, for example. And the files told many, many stories, these 11.5 million documents, and they stretched back as far as the early 1980s. And actually, there were companies in the documents that go back even further. There was one company we found from the 1930s. And this secrecy world is, is not static. It morphs, 
it changes, it reacts. And so the files tell the story of the evolution of this world, the secret world. For a long time, particularly in the 1980s and 90s, the secrecy world was the Wild West. You know those three monkeys, see nothing, hear nothing, say nothing? That's what governed the secrecy world. If you were creating an anonymous shell company for someone, you asked no questions. It wasn't necessary to know who actually owned the company. They're called the ultimate beneficial owner. Once the company was created, you put the information into a file and forgot about it until a year had passed and it was time to send the invoice to renew. And sometimes not even then. There's a story in the, in the Secrecy World, my book, about a man who was the biggest client of Mossack Fonseca in Geneva. And he actually ends up selling his office to the firm and leaving the country in the middle of the night. Before that, he had joked to a subordinate that he slept with a gun under his pillow. It turned out that he had a habit of taking the money to renew the company, but never actually renewing the company until the client needed it for something. So the story of Mossack Fonseca that is in the files is of a firm that found a great business model for that period of the 1980s and 90s. It was high volume, low cost. Think of McDonald's, doubtful nutrition, but pretty filling sometimes. Jurgen Mosek and Ramon Fonseca were innovators. They took an island chain known for tourism and drug smuggling, the British Virgin Islands, where nothing much was happening, and turned it into a belching factory of shell companies. In fact, so many incorporators followed their lead, the two men decided to look elsewhere to try and gain a new advantage. And I'm going to read you a little bit about that right now. As more incorporators crowded into the BVI and the Bahamas, Mosfond looked to increase its business elsewhere. The United States pointed the way. As a specialist in maritime law, Mossack was familiar with the Liberian ship registry. Since the 1950s, Liberia had registered shipped ships under its own flag, but the public registry was never based in Africa. Rather, the registry resided in a suite of offices in New York City. It was created by a former U.S. Secretary of State in conjunction with corporate interests like Shell Oil. The Liberians readily assented in return for a cut of the proceeds. Mossack thought, if the Americans could have a monopoly by running their own public registry, why couldn't Mosfan? The partner sent the recently widowed manager of their Jersey office, an American named Nancy Broadhurst, to the South Pacific. Her instructions were to find a friendly country that would allow itself to be used as an exclusive jurisdiction for Mosfan companies. Quote, she disappeared for a week, literally disappeared in Papua New Guinea, remembers Fonseca. We were really worried. We thought maybe she'd been eaten by cannibals or something. Broadhurst had gone prospecting at an offshore conference in New Guinea, and one day at the conference, she was sitting at the hotel bar, bemoaning her fate, and struck up a conversation with a neighbor on the stool beside her. She told him she'd been sent out by the bosses in Panama to find a magical land to serve as a new location for offshore companies. Her new friend listened with interest. We can do that, he told her. Her barmate, Frank Louis, was the premier of the island nation of Nui, a sparsely populated coral outcrop situated in the middle of nowhere. Nui is 1,500 miles northeast of New Zealand. It's currently about 103 square miles in size, but rising sea levels threatened to shrink its land, land mass. Europeans first laid eyed on the place in 1774, when the locals repeatedly prevented Captain James Cook from landing there, prompting him to dub it Savage Island. New Zealand annexed it in 1901, but approved self-government for Nui under an association agreement in 1974. As New Zealand's ward, Nui received a stipend, but the money wasn't enough to make ends meet, according to Mossack. When Broadhurst met Louis, the island's leaders were already investigating converting to a tax haven to create additional income for its approximately 500 inhabitants. Broadhurst traveled to Panama and joined a group of Mossfan lawyers to draft an incorporation law for Nui. They largely copied the BVI law, which itself had been copied from Delaware, and customized it for Nui, adding some innovations of their own. For example, the law allowed company names in Chinese characters, and the Russian Cyrillic alphabet, which the, F, which the BVI did not. The Nui International Business Company Act passed in 1994. 
Later that year, the firm took Frank Louis to Hong Kong as part of a road show to sell the jurisdiction to the Chinese. They advertised the island as the jewel in the crown of the South Sea. With the registry located in Moss Fon's offices, the firm could crank out a Nui company in under an hour at whatever price the firm determined. Moss Fon's offices around the world had the blank documents and the official seals pre-signed by the Nui deputy registrar, who happened to be a Moss Fon employee. All they had to do was check with Panama to ensure the name was available, get the international business company number, pull up the correct template, and hit print. Quote, we could control the process, control the quality, and the speed, said Mossack. All that control, though, did not prevent Mossack's Nui companies from being used by criminals. James Abori, the governor of Nigeria's oil-rich Delta State, opened a Nui company called Stanhope Investments while still holding office, using it to buy expensive properties in London. In 2012, prosecutors in the UK convicted Ibori of fraud and corruption, sentencing him to 13 years in prison. Gary Porritt employed his new e-company, Gold Star, to make it appear as if an outside company was buying shares in his South African investment company to artificially prop up its value, according to prosecutors. In Argentina, the father and son, Hugo and Mariano Jenkins, operated a network of offshore companies that U.S. prosecutors alleged were used to pay bribes in exchange for multi-million dollar television contracts to broadcast soccer matches. The Mosfond files show that one of these companies, Cross Trading, based in Nui, purchased the rights for Ecuadorian soccer matches for $111,000 and then quickly flipped them to the Ecuadorian broadcaster, Tele Amazonas, for $311,000. Nui never equaled the success of the BVI, though. Despite the ease of incorporation, the island was always a tough sell to many potential customers. Quote, if you think people don't know where the BVI was, try explaining to them where this empty spot in the middle of the Pacific Ocean was, said Mossack. Now, there were all kinds of dangers that came from selling companies, but asking no questions about the owners. At first, these were the kinds of problems that just afflicted society, but not Mossack Fonseca personally. But it didn't stay that way, as this story illustrates. Rafael Caro Quintero, the founder of the Guadalajara cartel, may have been Mexico's first narcotics billionaire. He owed his fortune to transporting Colombian cocaine and growing marijuana and opiates. In late 1984, Enrique Kiki Camarena, a U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration undercover agent, infiltrated Carl Quintero's thriving marijuana business. He led the DEA to El Buffalo, a massive pot plantation in northern Chihuahua, where they, could found, where they found more than 1,000 acres of plants. Mexican soldiers destroyed product likely worth several billion dollars. Consumed by fury and paranoia, Carl Quintero lashed out. An American novelist from Minneapolis and a dental student from Fort Worth were among the first to die. In January 1985, the two friends mistakenly walked into the Crazy Lobster, a restaurant Caro Quintero owned in Zapopan outside Guadalajara. The drug kingpin was having a private party inside. The revelers kidnapped the students, who they may have suspected were DEA agents. They tortured them in the kitchen with knives and ice picks before burying their bodies in a local park. One of them was still alive when they put him in the ground. The following month, Caro Quintero's men grabbed Camarena after he left the American consulate in Guadalajara. They burned the 37-year-old ex-Marine with cigarettes and beat him with a tire iron for two days in a secret chamber behind one of Caro Quintero's mansions. A doctor was on call to keep the DEA agent alive during the ordeal. Before Mexican authorities discovered Camarena's mutilated body, Caro Quintero boarded a Falcon executive jet and left the country. That March, he traveled to Costa Rica, where he did business with Jose Marie Pla Horet, a local lawyer with a crooked clientele. A few years earlier, when the U.S. government wanted to serve an indictment on the fugitive financier Robert Vesco for looting a mutual fund of hundreds of millions of dollars, the U.S. Embassy suggested they deliver the papers to Pla Horet, one of Vesco's attorneys. In the early days, Mossack provided Panamanian companies to Pla Hort and several other Vesco associates. On April 4th, Costa Rican authorities arrested Caro Quintero for criminal acts related to nar narcotics trafficking. 
During his time in the Central American nation, he alternated among the four properties he owned, dined at the best restaurants, and traveled around in a limousine. Despite the publicity surrounding the arrest, Plahort managed to stay in the background. About a week after Caro Quintero's extradition to Mexico, Plahort registered the first of two Panamanian companies on the drug lord's behalf with Jurgen Mosak. Wanting maximum secrecy, he paid Mosak to act as a director of the company. Mosak appears not to have known the real identity of the beneficial owner in this case. At least one of the companies held a sprawling mansion on the outskirts of the Costa Rican capital, San Jose. In 1989, a Mexican judge sentenced Carol Quintero to 40 years in prison, the country's then maximum. U.S. authorities later accused the drug pin of continuing his business while behind bars. The Treasury Department sanctioned Carol Quintero's friends and relatives for investing his considerable fortune in legitimate businesses. With his client in prison and the properties confiscated, Plahort stopped paying Mosfan. The companies fell into limbo. Plahort died on Christmas Eve in 2004. A year later, a Mosfan lawyer sent an email to the partners. The president and the secretary general of the Costa Rican National Olympic Committee had visited the office with a thorny problem. The Costa Rican government had given the committee Carol Quintero's mansion for its new headquarters, but the committee couldn't acquire legal title because the drug lord technically still, still held it through Mosfan's Panamanian company. The Olympic Committee wanted Mosak, as a director of the company, to, quote, donate the property to the committee to avoid a complicated judicial process. Giving away property that still technically belonged to one of the world's most fearsome drug traffickers seemed ill-advised to Mosak. The firm decided that the Mosfan directors would resign their positions. The Costa Ricans would have to so solve their legal issues on their own. Quote, Pablo Escobar was a child nursing at his mother's breast compared to our Carol Quintero, Mosek explained in Spanish in an email referring to the notorious Colombian drug kingpin. I don't want to be among those he will visit after he leaves prison. Mosek's instincts for self-preservation proved prescient. On August 9, 2013, a judge in Guadalajara unexpectedly released Caro Quintero on a technicality with 12, months remaining, with 12 years remaining on his sentence. Before the United States could extradite him, he disappeared. As of this writing, his name sits atop the DEA's list of fugitives. So the high volume, low cost model that was, the high cost, the high volume, low cost model was particularly opportune because it came at the fore of the beginning of the computer age, which made it easy to streamline. It was a time when there was incredible wealth in the developing world, even as countries like Russia and China and the US proved increasingly unwilling to provide welfare for their citizens. Now, the consequences of which can be seen in one heartrending story that I, I found in the documents involving Russia. As Putin and his cronies transfer billions of dollars to their children, ordinary Russians are struggling to survive. In a country rich in natural resources, Russia has a GDP per capita of about $9,000. The economic situation has forced many Russians to seek work abroad, people like Vladimir Kravoy, a 63-year-old machinist. In 2011, Kravoy joined the crew of the Russian cargo ship SS Ross. He signed a six-month contract that paid him $3,000 a month, a small fortune for most Russians. The Ross was owned by the Damelo Group, a BVI company created by Mosfan in 2004 through an intermediary in the United Arab Emirates. According to Mosfan, according to Mosfan's files, though this offshore company and others, oh, I'm sorry, uh, according to Mosfan's files, through this offshore company and others, four Russians own the Ross and several other ships. They added an additional layer of secrecy by shuffling the registration of their ships among small Pacific island nations like Tuvalu and Kiribati, which required little information or regulation for the ships that flew their flags. Instead of economic opportunity, Kravoy found himself a prisoner aboard a slave ship. The captain of the Ross stripped Kravoy and the other crewmen of their identification documents. The ship itself had no air conditioning. The sailors baked as it sailed through the Persian Gulf. Vermin infested the cabins. 
Food and water were scarce, soap non-existent. The captain physically abused sailors who complained and refused to pay them. At 423 feet, the Ross was compact with two large cranes in the middle and three enormous cargo holds below decks. While working on a diesel engine in the stern, Cravoy took a bad fall. Despite docking at several different ports, the captain denied his request to seek medical care. Instead, he forced Cravoy to fulfill his duties, including turns at night watch. Within a month, the machinist was dead. Another crewmate, Edward Bordachenko, went missing from the ship after complaining to the Russian Seafarers Union about the conditions aboard the Ross. His body was never discovered. Bordachenko's wife is convinced her husband was thrown overboard. When the captain refused to pay the rest of the sailors, they managed to escape and sought refuge at the Russian embassy in Kuala Lumpur. Russian police issued an arrest warrant for the ship, but the owners simply changed its name to MV Neri and continued sailing. The men also owned through a separate Mosfon company, the SS Veliz. This ship they abandoned in the Philippines, stranding a crew that included 12 Russians, eight Indians, and one Ukrainian without paying for their work. The owners declared bankruptcy and walked away from the company. In May 2012, Russian prosecutors filed charges against two of the owners, Vladimir Bobrov and Gleb Klokov, for, quote, use of slave labor with a threat of violence and slave labor which entailed the death of a person. The men were detained, but to date have avoided trial or prison. So, yes, you will say the secrecy world does allow for criminals to launder their ill-gotten gains and prey on the innocent, but it also services plenty of innocent people and most American multinational corporations. So, so why does this matter to us here today? And Miami is a great example of why. Foreign nationals bought nearly $6.1 billion worth of property in South Florida in 2015, just in 2015. Miami cash transactions for property is more than double the national average. Led by South Americans, Venezuelans, Brazilians, Argentinians, Colombians, much of the buying comes from those who distrust, distrust their countries and want to invest in the United States. But when anonymous shell companies are widely used, it also allows corrupt politicians and criminals to spirit their cash out of their countries. If they're not reporting to their local tax authorities, it can deprive already resource-poor governments of needed revenue. In 2014, developing countries lost between $620 billion and $970 billion to illicit outflows of capital. And at home, this behavior contributes to making Miami one of the worst places to be a renter in the country. So the United States, by one estimate, loses $70 billion a year in tax revenue from shifting corporate profits to tax havens. Republicans, perhaps naively, hope that some of that money will return home when they lower corporate tax rates, but there's little incentive to do so. That's to say nothing of individuals who are avoiding taxes legally or illegally through the secrecy world. That's billions more. What the Panama Papers and other ICIJ leaks, including most recently the Paradise Papers, show is a global elite that is no longer bound by the nation state in the way that most of us are. They live in multiple cities, they travel the world in private jets, and they keep their money offshore. Fifty percent of the wealth held in tax havens belongs to households with more than $50 million in net worth. Today, the top 1% of households own more wealth than the bottom 90% combined. This secrecy world feeds and protects an astounding inequality both here at home and abroad, and it's getting worse. This world of multimillionaires and billionaires is one President Donald Trump knows well and is working actively to benefit. Now, real estate has long been a, a frequent user of, uh, of the secrecy world, and Trump admitted during his campaign that he had 515 companies, including 378 registered in Delaware one of the leading tax havens of the world. In fact, Delaware's incorporation law was used as a template for Panama, the BVI, and other tax havens. I found nine of Trump's foreign business partners mentioned in the Panama Papers. Many more were connected to now indicted campaign manager Paul Manafort and son-in-law and presidential counselor Jared Kushner. Here's the story of one of them. Another apparent investor, oh, sorry. Here we go. Trump joined forces with Bayrock, 
in 2005, offering a brand name behind which Tafik or Reef's money could coalesce. Their best known project was Trump Soho, a 46 floor hotel condominium in one of Manhattan's trendiest neighborhoods. Trump announced the project on his television show, The Apprentice, in 2006. For the use of his name and input, Trump received a 15% cut of sales, with another 3% parceled out to two of his children, Ivanka and Donald Jr. In 2007, Arif cut a deal with Iceland's FL Group for $50 million in financing for Trump Soho and three other Trump-related projects in return for future profits. Trump signed a document agreeing to the arrangement, and FL Group was an international investment company surfing the Icelandic financial mania. Its principal Icelandic shareholders spun off offshore companies like a pinwheel, a number of them through Mosfam. FL Group would go belly up when the financial crisis exposed the fraud and self-dealing behind Iceland's economic miracle. A search of FL Group in the Mosfam files leads to substantial loans from Icelandic banks, a profligate Icelandic supermarket chain, investments in India, and Kupfink's largest debtor in Luxembourg. Iceland's special prosecutor, Olafur Hoxson, charged the company's former CEO, Hans Smarason, with embezzlement of about 22 million in corporate funds. But the businessman was acquitted at trial. A civil suit against Bayrock, filed by a former employee, Jody Chris, speculated that some of the money behind FL Group was Russian in origin. Chris alleged that Bayrock operated for years through, quote, a pattern of continuous related crimes, including mail, wire, and bank fraud, tax evasion, money laundering, conspiracy, bribery, extortion, and embezzlement. He further alleged that the FL Group's investment in the Trump Soho project was in fact a sale disguised as a loan to avoid paying approximately 20 million in taxes. Bayrock denied the allegations, and Trump insisted he had nothing to do with the financing, lending only his name. Quote, I don't know who owns Bayrock, Trump said in a deposition in 2011, despite having signed a document that stated clearly that FL Group was helping to finance the project. I never really understood who owned Bayrock. Another apparent, apparent investor in Trump Soho through Bayrock, according to a company investment pamphlet, was Alexander Mashkovich, a Russian billionaire who was part of a trio of shareholders behind Eurasian Natural Resources Corporation, ENRC, a conglomerate with far-flung interests ranging from mining to construction. A spokesperson for Mashkovich says the billionaire never invested in Trump Soho or Bayrock, despite what the pamphlet said. The mining mogul was also close to Kazakhstan's president for life, Nursultan Nazarbayev, whose grandson and, prince and other relatives had their own Mosfan companies. In 2011, the three principals behind ENRC, Mashkovich, Patok Chodyov, and Alajan Ibramiyov, were accused in Belgium of money laundering. The charges were subsequently dropped when they agreed to pay a settlement for an undisclosed sum without admitting wrongdoing. ENRC had deep ties with Mosfan, dating to at least 2003, having connected with the law firm through a trust company in Guernsey in the Channel Islands. Some of ENRC's companies were involved in mining in Congo. In West Africa, ENRC was implicated in a bribery investigation of the Israeli diamond magnate Dan Gertler, who also had Mosfan companies and HSBC Swiss bank accounts. Gertler denies any wrongdoing. In 2014, the Guernsey intermediary St. Peter's Trust attempted to move 15 ENRC companies directly to Mosfam. The law firm's compliance department reviewed the matter and discovered the companies were related to ENRC Limited, a joint venture between the trio of investors and the Kazakh government. All the people involved were politically exposed people, and ENRC had recently been delisted from the London Stock Exchange after a massive share price drop when investors bailed after a controversial mining deal with the Congolese president. The company faced multiple criminal investigations over corruption allegations in Kazakhstan and Africa. There were too many red flags, even for Mosfan. Due to the adverse results found in the course of our investigations, the decision is, do not accept these companies under our administration, wrote one of the firm's compliance officers. These were not qualms that apparently Bayrock or Trump had. When the Panama Papers uh, broke, it was everywhere. I'm sure everyone here saw it in one way or another, whether it was a Doonesbury cartoon or in the Miami Herald. 
The Prime Minister of Iceland resigned. He had a secret company. And later, the Prime Minister of, of Pakistan was also forced from office. And you can read uh, their stories in, in the secrecy world. Jurgen Mosak did not fully realize what had happened to his firm right after the publication, he told me, until he turned on the television and saw his life's work on every single channel. The journalistic collaboration had more than 300 reporters from around the world, and some worked in dangerous places like Russia or Egypt. Personally, I never thought of Malta in the European Union as one of those places until the tragic assassination of the blogger Daphna Caruana Galicia, whose death by car bombing in broad daylight was clearly a message to journalists everywhere. Her son, Matthew, is a staff member of the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. So let me close with an excerpt of how um, some countries in South America dealt with the publication of the Panama Papers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought I have, let's see. Here we go. In Venezuela, the communications minister, ministry sent a lengthy communique to the country's media advising them not to publish stories about the Panama Papers. Quote, it should be noted that these documents are being used selectively for certain policy areas on an international scale, the memo warned, hinting darkly, as the Kremlin had, that the release came from the CIA. The notes sketched out an oddly self-incriminating conspiracy theory. The first round of stories might be a decoy, the ministry postulated. Once the Panama Papers received validation from the world's media, quote, new information will be published on senior officials of the national government to justify the current attempt to increase interference and sanctions from the Obama administration, leaving us without room to maneuver before public opinion. Chillingly, the memo also singled out by name Venezuelan reporters working for independent media organizations that had participated in the project. Throughout the world, the publication of the Mosfan data fed into attacks on journalists and pre-existing political and social dramas in various countries. Reporters and editors wrestled with which part of the data was in the public interest. In Europe and the United States, the dominant concern was taxes and people evading them. In Latin America and Africa, Tax was a vital issue, but it took second place to concerns about corruption and political repression. In Ecuador, President Rafael Correa denounced the, project, denounced the project's participants on Twitter and rallied a troll army to send them a message. He helpfully included the reporter's social media accounts, which were then deluged, deluged with nasty comments. A dozen or so government supporters demonstrated outside El Comercio and El Universo, the two newspapers involved in the project. As Panama's La Prensa had done, the Ecuadorian newspapers ran their stories without bylines and after everyone else had already published. The findings sourced to ICIJ, not the leaked documents, revealed that the country's attorney general, the president's cousin, who was a former governor of the central bank, and the secretary of intelligence, who was a Mosfan intermediary, were in the data. The family that owned El Universo also had a Mosfan company, but the owner himself had alerted Monica Alimeda, the Quito bureau chief leading the investigation for the newspaper, about the firm. It had been, the company had been created after President Correa had won a civil judgment against the paper that threatened to shut it down. As part of his efforts to rein in the media, Correa had spearheaded the creation of the Orwellian named Citizen Participation and Social, and Social Control Council a few years earlier. The council sent a letter to the newspapers demanding that the reporters appear before it on Monday, April 18th. The release was on April 3rd. To hand over, he wanted them to hand over the Mosfan data and respond to questions. The reporter sent the letter the Friday before the meeting, declining to appear and explaining that they did not have the data. ICIJ did. A showdown appeared imminent. But on the intervening Saturday, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake devastated Ecuador. As the focus of the media and the government turned to the victims and the damage, the Monday meeting was quietly forgotten 
and the reporters were saved from having to appear before the committee. So thank you very much. Uh, that's all I had prepared for, for the reading, but I would love to take uh, some of y'all's questions. Uh, I suspect that we have knowledgeable people in this audience. Um, so <coughs> does anyone have any questions about, please. How does the Apple company fall into this? I mean, is this considered the same kind of? It is, they are absolutely. I mean, they're supposedly. They're absolutely users of the secrecy world. And where Apple really shows up is in the Paradise Papers, which came after the Panama Papers. The Paradise Papers were a leak from a, a law firm called Appleby, which is based in Bermuda. It's slightly different than Mossack Fonseca. They didn't have the same model. It was more high-end. So they had uh, uh, higher, you know, uh, the, the, the truly uber-wealthy, if you will, and a lot of corporations. Um, Whereas Mossack Fonseca tried somewhat to stay away from Americans, although they had quite a few, uh, Appleby really worked with a lot of Americans. There were more than 30,000 in the league. Um, so, App so Apple is in, is in uh, the Appleby League. And what's interesting about Apple is they have uh, come under quite a bit of attack uh, by the European Union because they've used Ireland to avoid billions of dollars in taxes and uh, basically sort of funneling their profits into Ireland instead of where they were made uh, in, in Europe and, and other places because uh, Ireland has a very low tax rate. But because the European Union has, Union has started to clamp down on that, Appleby uh, contacted, uh, I mean, Apple contacted Appleby and, uh, and asked them to find us another tax haven where we can continue to do this kind of thing. Um, this was obviously not what they were saying publicly at all. In fact, Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, has, has, has said and testified before Congress that, you know, we're not going to do this kind of stuff. Um, but what the Paradise Papers shows is, in fact, uh, it was still ongoing. Any other questions? Any questions? Oh, um, when you have a country, for example, that is not corrupt, and then you find people who are trying to evade taxes and so forth, you feel that they are really in the wrong, right? I mean, we're a society where taxes are used for streets, for schools, and so forth. But at the same time, then you have other countries that are corrupt in themselves, in, within the government, and there are private citizens who are trying to protect their wealth in many different ways. Um, with your experience, what, what was the big lesson that you got from all this? And that, where are we going to go? That is such a great question and observation really because say you are in Ecuador and you have managed to to, to, to make some money and uh, your neighbors are all offshoring their money and investing outside of the country and using these anonymous companies and not paying their taxes um, I think you would probably feel like a chump if you were the only one paying your taxes and particularly because there's a lot of corruption and uh, and you know the money sort of disappears and you don't really see the results of that so it is it is something that uh, it's it's one of those sort of collective action problems right where you need a, a groundswell of citizens who say this is not going to work anymore we all need to, to to stop doing this together what's so interesting about the panama papers and the paradise papers is is that and as i sort of mentioned that there's been this, this, this global elite, the, the uber wealthy, who no longer feel attached to any particular nation. You know, they, they live outside of the national rules that govern most of us. Um, and I don't know how you change that. Um, I think it's going to have to happen from, you know, from below, from, from individual citizens uh, gathering together and saying, no, if you're going to do business in this country, you need to pay your taxes here. Um, and, uh, and it will force some people out. I mean, there are people who, who live in these tax havens uh, precisely because they want to avoid uh, paying taxes, and, and, and I assume that will continue. Uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to, uh, to attack. And what's interesting is, you know, what Mossack Fonseca was doing was they were, because they had this, you know, high-volume, low-cost model, they were spreading these companies out, you know, hundreds of thousands of them to the world, and it's in a way sort of democratizing this behavior, right? It was acceptable or accessible to the merely rich, not just the uber wealthy. And uh, that has changed a little bit. I think the bar to entry is now a little bit higher. You have to be 
you know, much more wealthy to really to, for, to do this and to and to, to, to for it to have value. The other thing is is that uh, it has moved a little bit. So there's been so much pressure on the BVI and some of the other traditional tax havens that uh, the people are moving to Singapore, they're moving to Dubai, um, they're moving to other places uh, that are sort of the new frontier for this kind of behavior. So it's, it's, a, it's very difficult to, to stamp out. I mean, you can see it in the data in, in wonderful ways. I mean, one of the things that, that the, the sort of fascinating and I talk about a lot in the book are bear shares. So bear shares are these things where uh, you, you, own the, 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 you own the company, whoever owns this, bear share is a certificate, right? It's a, it's a share of the company. And say the company has two shares. And if you own these two certificates, you own the company. And if I give the two shares to you, then, you know, the two certificates, the two pieces of paper, then you own the company. And, uh, you know, law enforcement hates this because it's very easy to move assets around without any identifiable traces. Um, it's, it's sort of used by criminals and, and money laundering, and they have tamped down on it in some ways by, you know, outlawing bearer shares and other places by putting it under custodian. So well, it has to be in a safe and a lawyer has to have control of it. The... Um, the only two places left, actually, that offer bear shares are the Marshall Islands and Liberia, which both run out of the United States, uh, actually offices in New York and in Virginia. Um, but you would see in the data where one jurisdiction, say the BVI, would tamp down on bear shares, and then there would be a spike of incorporations in Panama where they still offered them. So it, it's sort of this thing that evolves and mutates to continue to... to be the, you know, do the same kind of behavior. Sure. I was wondering, um, have you been to the island uh, northeast of New Zealand, and how did you feel when Hugo Mariano Jenkins' uh, lieutenant committed suicide in Argentina, I think it was last month? These are both really good questions. I have not been to New Me. Um, and I, I would love to go. Ramon Fonseca said to me that he obviously went, and he said that it was it was beautiful, and, and that he he saw the most stars in the sky that he had ever seen in his entire life. Um, the the funny sort of story about Nui is that, uh, and you, I talk about this later in the book, is eventually New Zealand just got really frustrated with the bad press with Nui. And so they said, okay, we'll up the stipend if you agree to quit this business. We'll just give you the $3 million or whatever Mo Seconseca is paying you, and you can get out. And they did get out, but they kept one business that they were in. It wasn't uh, minting anonymous companies. It was selling 900 uh, sex phone numbers. So Nui continues to do that. Um, I hadn't heard about uh, the suicide, uh, but... Uh, I mean, this is this secret world. Uh, you know, people enter into it believing that it's going to stay secret, and when these things come out, they have all kinds of unintended consequences. I mean, the U.S. intelligence uh, uh, services have conjectured or, or, or postulated that part of the reason why Vladimir Putin attacked the DNC and uh, and the U.S. electoral system was that he was so upset about the revelations in the Panama Papers, and he blamed the Obama administration. And so that was one of the reasons why he, uh, he decided to go after uh, the, the U.S. Uh, election. So there are all kinds of unintended consequences from making the secret world public, but, you know, that's what happens. Victor? You answered one of my questions, uh, <laughs> but I, I wanted to uh, probe you a little further um, regarding solutions. Like as we as we sit here, uh, there are attorneys going around the planet trying to create a, a network uh, to hunt down hidden assets, and I'm wondering if a possible solution when we talk about unintended consequences are unhappy spouses who <laughs> right are are trying to track down their hidden assets, and is this maybe where the solution is may come from from lots of hidden asset attorneys networking around the planet, which is happening right now. Yeah, I mean, that's been going on for a while with, you know, it, it depends on the, the attorney and the place on how successful they are. I just don't think it's, you can really expect sort of real change in that sort of piecemeal way. But there are some great stories 
along those lines. I mean, D uh, uh, Dmitry, I think, is Rabolov, who is uh, this Russian oligarch. Um, he, uh, he got involved in a, a multi-billion dollar divorce, and uh, his wife accused him of hiding his assets in Mossack Fonseca companies. And, uh, and they went to, to war with uh, solicitors in multiple jurisdictions, and eventually she, she managed to get a couple billion dollars out of him. And I have one more question. Sure. Did I just hear you say that, that the, sec the secret world is responsible for our high rents in Miami, and you are blaming them directly? Can you elaborate on that, please? Yeah, I mean, it, well, basically you have all of these uh, foreign uh, nationals buying up property, oftentimes in cash, through anonymous companies. Um, and oftentimes of questionable, pro questionable provenance, you know, where that money is coming from. So they're buying investment properties. They may not even be living there, um, which is, you know, has its own host of issues. And that sort of crowds out people who, uh, you know, are, are, are more modest means um, who want to also buy properties, but they're just not available or the price has sort of skyrocketed. Please. Um. We were neighbors of Jurgen Mosak, and we were former partners of one of his ex-wives. Oh. Um, my question is, and, and we also know a few lawyers involved in this, <laughs> my question is, um, since the Americans that were implemented in the Panama Papers, have any charges, any criminal investigations been started against them? That's a great question. There, there had, uh, I think Interpol put out that there, there are like a hundred, you know, more than a hundred, several hundred investigations sort of underway. In Panama itself, there are at least six different criminal proceedings involving Mossack Fonseca. They were briefly detained. They were the detained for issue, two, almost uh, more than two months. It's quite funny, actually. They, they were involved in, uh, or detained, or prosecuted for, a Braz for their role in a Brazilian uh, the scandal issue, yeah. uh, called Lavallato. Uh, Operation Car Wash, which involves a construction firm called o o Odebrecht and uh, and Petrobras, the uh, the uh, the oil company, and so they went to uh, they, their their houses were were searched and, and they were they were going to go present themselves before the public ministry and Ramon Fonseca, who can be you know a hothead at times, uh, gave this impromptu press conference in front of, on the steps of the public ministry, where he basically accused the president and other people in the government of being involved in the same kind of corruption that, that he, that he and, and Jurgen were accused of. And he believes, Ramon believes, that that is why they ended up in jail for two months. So now there's, there's, there's several different criminal proceedings. Uh, they're keeping a very low profile in Panama, as, as you might know. And then they've got their own proceeding trying to figure out who hacked them, or whether in fact it was a, a hack or a leak, you know, which obviously has, has, has different consequences depending on which one it is. Please. Obviously you uncovered a lot of sensitive information. Were you ever threatened? No, I mean, personally I was, I was not threatened. I was very lucky. I, I was working out of New York, um, so it was not really a problem, but it, it certainly was an issue for, you know, our Egyptian colleagues and our Russian colleagues and others who who really had to, you know, be uh, be very careful. We had a Panamanian partner, La Prensa, and uh, and the lead uh, reporter editor on the project uh, towards the end of it needed a bodyguard. Uh, she had uh, been, um, you know, when Jurgen uh, Mosak uh, and, and Ramon found out, you know, when we sent them questions, uh, you know, towards the end of the end of the project, they visited La Prensa. They singled out her, even though she wasn't in the meeting, and uh, and you know intimidated that the intimated that they um, they knew who she was, and so they decided it was prudent to to get her a bodyguard. And they were attacked on Twitter and in other places. So uh, personally, no. I mean, in America, we're, we're we're fairly we're fairly safe from those things for the moment. When you get a, a gift like that, which is I think it, it was a data dump, correct? Um, and then really the, the heavy lifting comes in the processing. Now, is that going to be the face of the new sort of investigative journalism? It's going to be a leaker somewhere that, that, that gives you a Christmas present every so often. Right? I, I mean, I think it's a big part of it. I, I mean, obviously investigative journalism will be lots of different things, but 
these big data dumps are are a big part of the future of investigative journalism. There's just so much data now, and it's it's accessible, and uh, it's hard to keep under wraps. So we're going to see more of that. And ICIJ, and I talk about this in the book, is is really good now at making this sort of data accessible to lots of different journalists uh, through sort of the, their own secret platforms, uh, password protected and everything, and uh, and making them searchable. I mean, the Mossack Fonseca data came in all kinds of forms. It came as PDFs, it came as TIFF files and audio files and JPEGs and all these different things, and they managed to sort of crunch the data and, uh, and make it completely searchable by hundreds of journalists who did that in secret for a year. So this was no easy task to pull off, but I think we'll be seeing more of that, even though you know it, it's got its challenges. Um, from listening to you, it's, it, if you were to stick a pin in all these instances worldwide, um, it's so huge. Is there is there any coordination or end game among all these players, or you think it's all disparate activity worldwide? No, no. They, I mean, these the, the biggest players uh, uh, in the offshore world. Uh, meet. They know each other. They they attend conferences, um, and uh, and they're very agile at lobbying for their business. Uh, you know, the tax havens were in Washington recently, uh, trying to influence the, uh, the the tax bill that uh, the Republicans are discussing. Um, they, they they were very. Uh, they had a concerted effort to uh, to try to beat back um, other efforts to to reform the industry uh, in the 2000s, and I talk about that in the book. Um, so there, this is actually re remarkably coordinated. There's just too much money involved. Um, so yeah, it's they're, they're formidable, Mr. Powell. I have a question on the on the rent thing. You talked about how um, these shell companies and the money laundering that they facilitate raise the rents in Miami, but I've always wondered if on the main, Miami's a winner in, in money laundering, if like this is a good thing for our city, it, it, like, you know, I'm at Art Basel yesterday and I'm, I'm seeing the cartoonish money and I'm thinking, you know, on the main, is, is this good for Miami? Are we one of the winners of this economy? I mean, it, it really depends, right? I mean, I think it does, it does put money into the economy, but if you work in the service industry, you can't afford to live here. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, you know, and then, you know, a lot of this money is, is flighty, right? So, you know, how much of it is actually being preserved for taxes? If you look around, the infrastructure in this, in this county is falling apart. Um, and, you know, part of that is, is just, you know, as you know as well as anybody, Robert, the, the, uh, the, the inability and, and just innate corruption, for want of a better word, of the politicians in Miami-Dade County. But part of it is the fact that the, the, the tax revenue is not, is not really here, even though you have money coming in for the, the service stuff. Um, and there are taxes on you know, hotels and all that stuff, and they're, they're quite high. I, I think net, I mean, <coughs> there is a benefit for sure. And, uh, but it's not, it's not equal across the board. So there are losers and there, and there are winners and, 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 and probably more losers, I would guess. What are the dangers to the uh, overall worldwide stock market, et cetera, banks uh, to this outside activity? And is it was something they can do that's going to affect uh, the markets unknown to the rest of us? I mean, global capital moves around, and I mean, there's all kinds of ways it can uh, it can affect things. Uh, I've been talking a lot today about Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is sort of in a huge bubble right now. It has become a favorite tool of money launderers. I think in part because there has been more attention on these tax havens, and and sort of vetting of clients and due diligence has increased to some degree. Um, so if Bitcoin is in fact a bubble. And in fact, partly a bubble because a lot of the, the money that maybe went to banks or went uh, through anonymous companies is no longer going there because there are more rigorous due diligence. Um, if it pops, that will have economic consequences for the entire world, probably. And it all starts in part because of the, of the way this system works and, and efforts to control it. <coughs> Mr. Garcia. Jake, one question I have. 
as I see it, maybe you can clarify, this kind of situation crosses all political ideologies. So it's very dangerous. It's, uh, it's not something that you can say that this group or that group opposes it, but everybody's benefiting the left and the right. No, I think that's an absolutely good observation. I mean, both in the Appleby uh, Paradise Papers and uh, to a lesser degree in the Panama Papers, there are plenty of Democratic donors uh, to the Clintons and to, and to others. Um, this is, uh, uh, you know, they, they in the Paradise Papers, they found uh, one of the biggest Democratic donors who Forbes had completely gotten wrong. He was like four or five rungs higher than anybody knew because he had a trust with billions of dollars in it in Bermuda that, that nobody had, had ever heard about. It was sort of a secret trust. His plan was to use it as a charity and to give the money away, he says. Um, but but it, was, it was completely unknown. And, and, uh, and he's a huge Democratic donor. So it's, uh, it, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a class thing more than a, a political thing, I think. How about Africa? How is uh, the development? That is a great question. I mean, Africa is is sort of a, a poster child for the the problems of this system. Um, I mean, people like Dan Gerler and, and others have been using anonymous companies to uh, to pull out the resources from Africa without actually putting any money back into Africa, or or certainly not anything commensurate to what they're taking out, um, and. Uh, uh, there's a, uh, 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 I think it's Sasani Abacha, the former uh, head of um, Nigeria. Nigeria. Uh, he put hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, Swiss bank accounts that he just pulled from that country. And uh, they discovered that 20 years ago. And only now the Swiss are finally getting around to giving the last bit of it back to Nigeria. Um, it's, uh, so it, it's, a, it's a huge problem in Africa. And it's fascinating. I mean, if you talk to the African, you know, African journalists or people who know about this in Africa, um, they can talk at length about stuff like transfer pricing and all kinds of complicated tax issues um, because uh, they're increasingly aware that this system is, is, uh, is a great disadvantage to them. Sure. Do you get any sense of how the money people um, all flock to one place or another? How, do, how does word get around and, and how do all of them go to one place and what's the informational pipeline? It's amazing. I mean, it's just exactly what you would expect. There's conferences and there's pamphlets <laughs> and there's a, there's, a great, uh, there's a great anecdote in the book about um, a, a conference in... Uh, I think it's in, in Bermuda, if I remember, or, 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 uh, or someplace like that, where uh, there's a big debate within Mossack Fonseca because they've got all these leaflets, you know, these pamphlets that they want to hand out, which will tell you exactly how to avoid paying taxes in the United States. But they have to fly through the United States. And so what do you do? Because if Customs finds the pamphlets, that's going to be a problem. You know, at the very least, they'll confiscate the pamphlets. So they, they, they talk to one lawyer who's sort of well-versed in this, and he says the key is you send it to the hotel where the conference is by mail, and then you can go through the United States and you don't have to worry about the pamphlets that tell U.S. citizens how to, uh, how to avoid paying taxes through this system. Um, but there are all kinds of, you know, conferences and, uh, and different ways. You know, this, this system is really run... Uh, by lawyers, by accountants, by bankers, and they're the ones who let clients know, you know, how to use it. Um, the banks were, were big players in this. Uh, at a certain point, it got too hot for them, and they, they, they kind of pushed it out the door a little bit, but, you know, kept it going. So there would be relationship managers of the bank who had been the ones urging their clients to set up these anonymous companies, and what they would do is they would they would make it so the relationship manager was no longer officially an employee of the bank. But he would have, you know, but he would continue to have the same relationships, you know, both with the bank and with the clients. So what's interesting is there's sort of a hot potato game here where nobody wants to claim responsibility for these companies. You know, it's, you know, even though the banks are the ones, or the, the accountants or the lawyers are the ones who, 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 who set them up on behalf of the clients, they'll say, oh no, 
It's the intermediary who actually created the anonymous company who, who, who's at fault or who you need to go to, or it's the client, and, and nobody will really take responsibility for it, and that's one way to insulate yourself from the legal consequences. Have you seen evidence of a subpoena or a complaint for a pure bill of discovery being successful with the Grand Cayman Bank? I know that Grand Cayman has some banks that are multinational. In other words, they're not just limited to Grand Cayman. I can't remember which ones in particular. But isn't there starting to be some inroads where a subpoena or a order from a U.S. district judge will invade the information barrier? You know, I don't know about the, the Grand Caymans in particular, but there is a story that I tell in this book about a lawsuit that was pursued by a billionaire named Paul Singer against Mossack Fonseca in Nevada. And what's interesting about this is uh, Mossack Fonseca had a franchise, had an office in Nevada, in, in Las Vegas, and they claimed to Paul Singer that the office was in fact not really part of the firm, that it was a separate entity, and that they just had a, uh, you know, a client uh, uh, user a relationship with, with Mossack Fonseca. And what we found through the documents was in fact that it was absolutely part of Mossack Fonseca, and in fact, Mossack Fonseca you know, operated the phones and, and, and controlled everything. But what Singer managed to do in court was to prove that this subsidiary was in fact part of Mossack Fonseca and that the court had a right to, to depose and to get information directly from Mossack Fonseca. So I think if you were able to show that a bank was in fact operating in the United States and not operating independently, but actually part of a larger sort of institution in another place, you might be able to use the same, you know, legal logic to, to get at the at the bank in the place where it, where it actually is based. Sure. Is, is all this moving and uh, hiding of resources and money be one of the greatest threats against the free press because of their wanting to hide all of this information? Um, I think the greatest threat against the free press right now is is the authoritarian bent of certain leaders who are calling, you know, journalism fake news or attacking journalists by name or the press in general uh, more than the offshore system in, in general. Um, I mean, that's just sort of my personal opinion. Sure. Um, so part of one of the effects of, I mean, these kind of publications is kind of the diminishment of the attorney-client privilege and also kind of when you see the CIA documents being disclosed, that's national security being diminished. What do you, do you see that as a problem and how big is it, do you think? It's a really interesting question. I mean, and I talk about this a little bit in Secrecy World. The, the IRS and others have been reluctant to go after the law firms that set these uh, uh, structures up because they're worried about client, attorney client privilege. Now there's a, a widespread belief at least in law enforcement, that the you know setting up an anonymous shell company or a trust is not actually legal activity, so it would not be protected by the, the attorney-client privilege. But you know the, the the IRS and, and the Justice Department often are, are gun shy. They don't like to lose. They don't like to invest resources where it's not guaranteed that they'll win, and so uh, they have been reluctant to sort of push push the point. Um, but I, I mean, a lot of people think that this is this is just simply not covered by that privilege. Okay, thank you. Sure. you touch up on the uh, art world and how they're finagling money through the art world. Oh yeah, art Basel. There's a whole chapter about the art world, right? um, and uh, and it's uh, it's 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 great fun. I mean the. You know, there are lots of reasons why you would have an offshore company for, for to buy a painting. Uh, you might be buying it somewhere and moving it to another place. And um, But it really is, uh, particularly I go into, into great detail about the, the free ports. You know, art has become to some degree, because of the high value, uh, another commodity, an investment. Not necessarily something that you hang on the wall as much as you stick in a vault and, and wait for it to appreciate. And so as part of that, it is 
sort of dovetailed very nicely with this sort of secrecy world and, and the anonymous companies. And, uh, and it's being used across the art world. Um, there's some interesting stories in here uh, about uh, a group of collectors um, who uh, bought a painting that might have been stolen by uh, the Nazis, and they used an anonymous company to hide that, uh, the provenance of the, uh, of the painting. Uh, there's another wonderful story in here um, about uh, the, f the, the, the first big modern art uh, auction, in, which really kind of changed the art market. And apparently, the paintings people thought were belonged to this this sort of very well known collector family, but they had already actually been bought uh, by the largest shareholder of Christie's, which was doing the auction, and nobody knew about it because it was all done through a newy company. Um, so uh, the art world is is, uh, is is sort of changed in the same way as this, you know, with the uber wealthy and the and the offshore system. Um, has sort of trans transmuted it in some way. Is, is there any um, indication that Robert Mueller's investigation is looking into the area that you've been looking into as part of their exploration of the Russian involvement in the election? That's a great question. And I think, uh, I mean, with the Manafort indictment, I mean, it's all over this. Uh, uh, you know, he's looking at Cyprus companies and uh, that Manafort set up and bank accounts, and, and you know, clearly the allegation is that there was money laundering going through that. I mean, Cyprus has long been a bad actor in this world. Uh, someone told me that in Cyprus, you, when you bought an anonymous company, an anonymous shell company, you got a bank account that came along with it. You didn't even actually have to open up the bank account. It just came attached to the company. Nobody knew who was behind the company or any information like that. So uh, Manafort uh, is being accused of, of using that system for money laundering. I mean, Mueller's got a, a crack uh, team of investigators and prosecutors, and I suspect they know this world really well and most of the tricks. And so I, I think they'll be looking more at that. I mean, Kushner, Jared Kushner, as I say, has got uh, a lot of connections into this world. Um, he, you know, he does business with a lot of different people, and, uh, and they're involved in all kinds of things, including ties back to the Magnitsky um, the death uh, in Russia, which uh, is a, was a big part of this whole scandal because Russia was trying to uh, get rid of the sanctions that that triggered. What about Wilbur Ross? No, please. What about Wilbur Ross? Right, Wilbur Ross was in the Paradise Papers, uh, the latest ICIJ leak, and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, Wilbur's had some bad, uh, some bad days recently, and that was only part of it. Uh, it turns out that he, you know, he said that he divested himself from, um, you know, from most of his companies. Uh, he wasn't exactly clear and specific in. Um, in his testimony and his filings, uh, he kept a piece of a company that uh, does uh, shipping business uh, with Russians, including, um, I think, the, the son-in-law of, of Vladimir Putin, who's, who's married to his, his daughter. Um, and this was a bit of a scandal for Wilbur Ross, including also the fact that well, this was not broken in the Paradise Papers, that he had lied about his uh, net worth. Um, but again, it's 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 the, the ability of these offshore companies to sort of allow one to hide your, your activities and, and to, to dodge sort of transparency becomes a particular problem if you're going to be a public official. Sure. Have you gotten any have you gotten any feedback from anybody who says you got it right or you got this wrong? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, thankfully not so much you got this wrong, but. Uh, Certainly, uh, you, know, you, you, you got it right. Um, you know, this is, this is a very complex uh, world, and, and, and it's important to sort of note that it's not, you know, it's not black and white all the time, right? I mean, there are legitimate reasons to, you know, where one could have an offshore company. You're not necessarily breaking the law to have uh, an anonymous shell company. Um, although, uh, as, as someone, as one of the Mossack Fonseca lawyers says in an email, 95% of our, of our business is to help people avoid taxes. But again, avoiding taxes is not necessarily illegal. It's evading taxes that is, and we can talk about the, the distinction between the two. But 
so yeah, I mean, people people feel I even gotten some nice comments from people in Panama who who appreciate the fact that that I, I really make a point of explaining and saying in the book that the biggest players and influencers in this world are the United States and the UK because the UK has all of those you know affiliated countries uh, the BVI and Jersey and the Channel Islands and and all of that that are the biggest players in this and Delaware is is a monster when it comes to anonymous companies I mean they're pulling in a billion dollars a year just from the fees associated with with selling these companies and they're selling them to all kinds of people including according to the Justice Department uh, you know Eastern European and, and Russian criminal syndicates so I think the, the Panamanians felt really bruised and beaten by the fact that it was called the Panama Papers, um, even though really most of the, the, the companies were based in the BVI, and uh, Panama's own incorporation law comes from Delaware. So uh, you know, I make that clear in the book and, and, and try to, 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 to assign responsibility appropriately, and, and I think uh, that was appreciated by some of the folks involved. Great. Well, thank you so much. And I, I, I guess I will be signing.